Great. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here at this conference. And I really want to thank you, Michael, and thank Stephen for all of the work that you do for getting the, the real truth about health out to the people. Um, this is my third year at this conference. And I just, I wish we were in the room together. Really, really wish we were. But I just want to put out appreciation for all of the speakers and all of you here today. I think many of us, maybe all of us, are on a path of understanding that the real truth about health is that if we change our diets, we can reclaim our health and change our lives. And I think it's also true that if we change our food system, we can reclaim planetary health and change the future for the health of our children. So that's what I want to talk with you about today. Um, is the need, the desperate need to shift for so many reasons to um, decentralize, de-escalate our food system that's currently addicted to pesticides to grow industrial commodity crops uh, that are, are largely not feeding people. And what are the barriers to changing this? So I want to talk about some of the old systems and patterns and ways um, of behaving that we see when we dig through the documents of the world's largest pesticide companies. So I wanna talk with you today on two levels, both the personal health, uh, what we can do to reclaim our own health and the systemic level of food system. How can we act to reclaim our food system and what's, what's getting in the way of that? So I'm gonna be speaking today specifically about disinformation and how companies engage in a very wide ranging, very aggressive tactics to control the narrative about our food system. And I think these details are important to understand. And I have lots of details to share coming straight from uh, Monsanto and Ally's very own documents. So in their own words, their own documents, uh, the secrets of how they run their disinformation playbook. And I think it's important to understand both to see what we're up against in terms of systemic um, entrenchment and also all of the many ways that companies, other entities too, but I don't think we talk enough about how corporations do that, about how they use all of the channels of communication and influence to surround us with um, truths that aren't true. Uh, that we need pesticides to feed the world, uh, that pesticides are safe, that there's no choice but to continue on with this system. So shining a light on all that so we can see it more clearly so that we can also um, think, you know, find strategies ourselves to break through the disinformation that's coming at us from all angles. So we're really gonna break it down today about how they do it, the many, many tricks. Um, and, and it's astonishing, even for those of us who have been on the receiving end of it, many people who speak on behalf of a healthier food system, who raise concerns about pesticides or factory farming, industrial food, um, have been targets of these disinformation campaigns. So some of this will feel familiar to you. And I think on the whole, it's very um, surprising the extent to which they must go, which in a, in a way is good news because it really takes a lot of disinformation um, and deliberate effort at narrative control to keep these systems going. And I, before I jump into my slideshow, I wanna say also just one more thing about systems and institutions. I wanna keep the focus on, on, on that level because I don't believe this is a story about us versus them or people on the good side versus people on the bad side. I think that we are in a time when some of us see and many of us don't yet see that the institutions that are failing us and, and failing us on all levels, failing to protect life and honor life and failing even to allow for a future at this current point, but they're just human agreements and we are free at any time to make different decisions and different agreements to create new institutions and systems that respect and value life. So I think many of us here today are on the path of, of wanting to understand how to do that and that it's important also to see clearly first what we're up against. So with that, I'm going to um, share my screen here and jump into my slideshow. 
Okay. Okay. So here we go. So I'm going to be talking today about Merchants of Poison. This is a report that I published in December. And a huge shout out to my wonderful co-authors, Kendra Klein from Friends of the Earth. She's a senior scientist there. And Anna LaPay uh, from Real Food Media. We worked on this report for many years. Um, and it comes from, uh, as this image portrays, straight from the documents of Monsanto and the pesticide companies. And we had so many documents, such a wealth of material to work from, to read, to understand, to try to explain what do these documents tell us about the playbook of how pesticide companies control the narrative about our food system. So that's the big uh, picture that I'll get into, but I want to start with telling you why I got interested in this topic. Um, and that goes back to 2012. And this is a graph, um, the horrible little graph. <laughs> uh, if any of you are around, this is 2012. Um, 2012, California was the first state to put to voters a question, should we label genetically engineered foods? So prior to that in the United States, we there, there wasn't a lot of talk or press or concern rising to the forefront about GMOs. They were very controversial in Europe, tons of press coverage, protests, um, consumer groups working on uh, campaigns against GMOs in Europe, and uh, required labeling. So companies were already labeling for Europe. They largely weren't selling GMO foods in Europe. But here in the United States, between the mid 90s and the mid 2000s, our food system uh, proliferated with GMOs, corn and soy, primarily, um, just infiltrated our food system totally. And there was very little conversation about it. But when you ask people, did they want these food labeled? The overwhelming answer was yes. So this is a graph that was done by Pepperdine University. They tracked the ballot initiatives in California all through the year. So this graph started in July and went through, um, it stopped actually just before election day. Um, so what happened here? Well, you can see that more than 60%, 65, even 70% of people, the green line, agreed that yes, we should label genetically engineered foods. And that's a huge level of support. And this was bipartisan support, Republicans, Democrats, all demographics, high, high support for labeling GMOs. And then you see, if there was an exact date on this graph, you would see that the downturn starts on October 1st, 2012, and public support takes a steep dive off a cliff, basically. Now, that was the day that Monsanto and other pesticide and food companies started to spend their war chest to defeat this labeling campaign. They raised $46 million. So this was about a million dollars a day in very intense uh, blizzard of disinformation, lies, confusion, just blanketed the state. And it was very intense. It was like every other radio um, commercial, TV commercials, uh, flyers to everybody's home, billboards, just full court press, confusion, and scaremongering about a label. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it worked. And one of the depressing things about this campaign and any political campaign, many, many, many people are making their decisions about how to vote based on what they see on TV. So, um, so many people, uh, just abandoned their desire to see this food labeling. And you can see the lines crossed and we lost uh, the election. Um, there's more to the story of this graph, which I'll tell at the end, which was a, a, a positive and surprising part of the story about how we rallied back and, and we actually won the vote on election day, but had lost too much in the early days um, to make up for it. So, this happened, the month of October 2012 was a terrible, terrible dark time. Um, and we wanted to know, how did they do that? How does the system work? What's going on behind the scenes? Because one of the astonishing things was that it was so many different kinds of people, professors, lawyers, 
Nobel laureate scientists, um, influencers of all kinds that were suddenly marching to the tune of Monsanto's choir. Uh, we knew that the talking points were coming straight from the corporate funded no campaign and the speakers of the talking points seemingly disconnected from the companies were just singing to the tune as a choir. So we really wanted to understand how does that messaging work? How does the influence flow work? How does the money work? Um, so we decided to investigate this. And my um, colleague at the Prop 37 campaign, Gary Ruskin, he was the campaign manager and I was the media director of that campaign. We decided to launch US Right to Know and to start investigating this question, how did they do it? So Gary, uh, a brilliant public researcher, he'd worked for 30 years with Ralph Nader on an uh, organization called Commercial Alert and used you know, the old tried and true sort of shoe leather research investigation techniques, um, which involved largely public records requests um, that we filed all over the place, public universities, governments, other entities that are public. Um, and also eventually worked with whistleblowers and, and other sorts of just research and reporting um, to try to get at the answer to this question. How do they do it? And so we've written lots of um, articles, reporting at usrtk.org, um, fact sheets on front groups. We just have a huge wealth of information there about the, the different elements that are in play with these uh, disinformation campaigns for both the pesticide industry and also the ultra processed food industry. We've done a ton of work also trying to get at their documents and, and glean what they can tell us about how much control processed food companies, um, Coca-Cola and the junk food companies have over public health spaces, public health groups, professional groups, dietitians, et cetera. So I really encourage folks to check out our website at usrtk.org. Gary has now co-authored 15 academic studies that discuss these documents and, and lessons that we've learned from them. So we've got tons of secrets to share and inf information documents posted. Um, and with Merchants of Poison, I wanted to look through, uh, trying to analyze and explain what do we know about how they run the playbook. So I'm going to get into that, but first, I um, now the report is specifically a case study about um, Monsanto and glyphosate, and I want to explain um, why we focused on those elements. And the reason really was because we had so much specific information about just that campaign and just that campaign, one company running a campaign to protect one chemical um, is, is just immense. And of course, we know this happens. The same tactics, the same playbook is in play with all of the chemical companies that are now currently controlling our food system. So this is a a little reminder about the, the corporations that control our food system. Since 2020, um, we've seen just amazing consolidation in the agrochemical industry. Um, to, so that by 2020, just four companies controlled most of the seeds and most of the pesticides um, for sale. So this is a breakdown of, of who owns what. So we see the leaders are Bayer, which now owns Monsanto, um, Corteva, which is a new name for Dow DuPont. And then we have ChemChina, Syngenta, and BASF. And uh, I want to just give a shout out to this report, Food Barons 2022 from the ETC group. I have a link here in this slide. And I will uh, share the slides later. I'll have a link straight to the slides. Um, and also, if anyone wants any of my information, you can contact me, Stacy S T A C Y at usrtk.org, and follow me on Twitter at Stacy Malkin, and I'll be sharing slides there and also give them to the conference. Okay, so this report is very eye-opening in terms of um, the shifting landscape of power in the food system, and they talk about the crisis profiteering from COVID and how that played out. Um, digitalization, 
and a lot of concerns about that, about who owns the data from farming system or who will own it and shifting landscape of power, which is just this mad rush to consolidate. Lots of research also on how consolidation is bad for farmers, bad for consumers, bad for the food system, bad for the environment. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's happening at, at a fast clip. <laughs> and um, one thing that if you if you've looked at the pesticide industry at any length, one thing that would jump out at you about all these names, Syngenta, Bayer, Monsanto, Corteva, Dow, DuPont, all of them, all of them have long histories of hiding the harm of their products. They have all participated in all of the strategies that I'm going to talk about related to Monsanto and glyphosate. Um, and we could just name a few scandals, atrazine, uh, the Teflon chemical, PFAS, uh, Clopyrifos. These companies are just basically, in my view, they won their market by um, corruption. It's a consolidation of corruption. And I think this is a true story across many sectors of the economy that the companies that were willing to hide, hide their harm the most, pay their workers the least, et cetera, et cetera, you know, won the market and now are uh, exhibiting just uh, very concerning levels of control, uh, in this case, over our food system. So, okay, these are the, the bad guys, but bad systems. Um, and then I also want to mention why glyphosate. So glyphosate is um, just a few graphs here about glyphosate that I think are pretty useful. It's the most widely used herbicide in the world. Um, the increase, especially in the United States, has been super dramatic, 3,000% since the 90s. And a large reason for that is genetically modified foods. So you can see here over on the right, the adoption of genetically engineered crops in the US. We have almost all of our US corn supply, almost all of our US soy supply is herbicide tolerant, and much of that is engineered to resist glyphosate. Um, you see on the bottom, although we hear lots of propaganda about how GMOs are, have all sorts of wonderful traits, well, what we hear is they will someday have all sorts of wonderful traits. They currently are mostly used um, as part of the pesticide treadmill. They're herbicide tolerant. Some of them are also insect resistant, but the vast, vast majority of acreage is herbicide tolerant and sprayed with glyphosate. That has caused many problems. The glyphosate is no longer working as well. Um, and weeds have become resistant. And now companies like Bayer are suggesting um, multiple stacked traits, genetically engineered seeds. So those would be seeds that are engineered to tolerate the spraying of glyphosate uh, and other, a, a mix of other chemicals, 2,4-D dicamba um, are among them. So the treadmill is escalating. Um, Companies obviously have found a profit stream in this uh, and are reluctant to give that up. So although genetic engineering is changing and new uses are coming into play because it's getting much easier to do, and there were whole talks about this at the conference, so I won't get into it, but I'll say that uh, they have a very successful profit line here, the pesticide companies, and we'll see it continued because a lot of the proposed uses of new GMOs in the pipeline have to do with um, chemical tolerance, which is, you know, a, a good good for their profits and bad for, unfortunately, the soil and for the future of farming. I think we're also seeing just in the big picture about consolidation and why I think that ETC report is so important is the next phase of consolidation is now really the merging of the food system with big data. So with the Amazons and Googles and efforts to um, track all data on farms, uh, feed that into an AI system, and then sell that knowledge back to farmers along with products to go with it. So the same sorts of questions and concerns come up. Who, who owns that data? Who has that power? Um, and what is the accountability and transparency for that system? Okay, so merchants of poison. We dug through all the documents and we um, apologize if you can't see this, it might be a little bit too big, but 
you get the idea. We narrowed it down to five major tactics that uh, Monsanto was using to control the narrative about glyphosate. Now, how we came about this, um, I want to talk about the source materials that we used for this report. So part of it, I mentioned before that we started to file public records requests at US Right to Know. And so this was in 2015. We, over the years, have obtained many, many, many documents, thousands of pages of documents um, from corporations, from universities, from government sources um, that helped us kind of get under the covers at how they were running their uh, public relations. Also in 2015, um, people started to sue Monsanto. That was the year that the World Health Organization um, determined that glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen. And that uh, launched off uh, many people who had that particular type of cancer that arises as the most strong correlation in the science, and that's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So uh, as of now, over 100,000 people, um, and these are farmers, groundskeepers, landscapers, everyday gardeners who used glyphosate Roundup in their homes, um, suing Monsanto, now Bayer, with claims that exposure to Roundup caused them to develop non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Probably heard some about these trials. There were some big uh, jury verdicts. Uh, in one case, a couple was awarded a $2 billion verdict, both a husband and wife who used Roundup in their yard for decades. Uh, both had non-Hodgkin lymphoma. That's incredibly rare. So we've reported a lot about the trials. Um, I won't say more about that, except for a very important aspect of the trials is that many, many, many more documents, tens of thousands of pages became public. And so that those two bodies of documents, U.S. Right to Know Research and the trials, went into this presentation of uh, five ways that companies are, um, and it wasn't just Monsanto. In many cases, it was all of the companies working together as a team, but it was led by Monsanto. And a lot of the documents I'll talk about were Monsanto documents. So we see here some of the ways they do it, really from the ground up, um, corrupting the science from the beginning. Um, so the record is really clear that for 40 years, Monsanto scientists um, manipulated the scientific record in lots of different ways using lots of different techniques, um, ghostwriting papers, handpicking scientists, um, choosing public relations narratives that they wanted to bolster, and then figuring out how to do scientific studies to produce that narrative. Um, strong arming, influencing regulatory agencies, and really putting forth shoddy science to influence regulatory agencies again and again. Also, co opting academia. Um, public universities, unfortunately, are a huge part of the pesticide industry's public relations game. They really count on academics because they know that the companies are not necessarily seen as trustworthy but white coat academics are. And so we found many examples of white coat, supposedly independent academics who were actually working directly with Monsanto, in some cases paid directly by them to do public relations and lobbying. We also have the mobilization of many, many third parties, astonishing array of third parties. So I'll tell some details about kind of how that works. Um, and who the key players are. And also this attack, attacking and tracking efforts. Um, if any of you all have spoken out against the pesticide industry, they probably know who you are and have tracked you at some point. Um, it, it emerged that uh, in France, there was a whistleblower at one of the PR firms that came forth with lists of 200 people that the pesticide industry was tracking closely with personal details. What was your influence level? What was your opinion? Um, the media described it as friends and foes of pesticides. So they're really keeping 
good track of the landscape of who says what so that they can deploy trolls or front groups or academics to argue with you and just keep the, the, the fights going. Um, the scientist attacks were also a really important piece of how they dealt with um, glyphosate and to some extent got away with it. But, but the unfortunate thing for Monsanto is many of this much of this stuff came out in the press and really became quite widely known about how they manipulated the record on glyphosate. And then the final um, point here is how ways in which they weaponize the web and really dominate um, the searches that we see on Google. So there's your big picture. And I really love this quote from Gary Kasparov, because I think to me, it really says what is the most important thing to understand about corporate propaganda. The point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or push an agenda. It is to exhaust your critical thinking, to annihilate truth. So with a lot of these strategies, like this mobilizing third parties, the attacks on scientists, you're not having debates about the substance with these um, corporate PR efforts. It's instead efforts to shame, to silence, to discredit, to make noise, to confuse, to overwhelm. But that's how they won Proposition 37 in the end, just a blizzard of confusion that makes people say, forget it, I don't want any part of that. And so this blizzard of confusion um, intended to have people, have all of us back off this idea that we need to reclaim and radically change the food system in order to survive, in order to deal with climate change, in order to feed the world. So let's, with that, dive a little bit more into, I want to tell, in each of these areas, I want to tell, tell a story, a scandal from the documents. Um, I'll tell some overall points and then also just give you an example of flavor for how, how they do their activities. So in the first piece, corrupting science. Um, so as I said, this has gone on for a long time. It really was exposed, lots of press coverage about lots of different aspects of how they did it. Um, you know, ghost writing, um, really having influence over scientific journals and what gets published. Um, people with conflicts of interest that weren't disclosed, chairing important meetings that then decided about glyphosate safety. Um, people straight up writing papers that Monsanto had framed and Monsanto scientists had uh, had a heavy hand in that, where that relationship was not disclosed to the public. One example, um, just to again, give you a flavor of it. So there, there you see Monsanto scientists talking in the emails amongst each other about vulnerabilities in the science. And they had quotes around them, but vulnerabilities in the science meaning that here are some ways that glyphosate runs into trouble if you really study it um, closely, or some scientists think so. One of those areas is genotoxicity, which is toxic to the genes, and evidence that glyphosate can set genes up to, to be more susceptible to cancer. So the scientists see there is vulnerability in this area for them, for the profit line of glyphosate, so they hire a scientist to study it and write a paper, go through the literature, and what, is, what does he, he think? So the scientist comes back and says, uh, this is a concern, and here's all many more studies that you should conduct to truly understand it. So they take this report, they go back talking amongst themselves, and you see the scientist saying, we're not going to do those studies that he suggests. Um, can we convince him to rewrite this study or should we go find another, uh, another good scientist? In other words, a friendlier to Monsanto scientist. So they end up hiring another scientist and helping him to shape a report that makes this look like less of a concern. So this goes on with, you know, in various ways through decades. Um, 
And I think another really important piece, because their main line of defense for glyphosate and all the pesticides, EPA says it's safe. The European Union says it's safe. But those processes are um, extremely influenced by corporate viewpoints and, in, and corporate science. And there was recently a study uh, in Europe where uh, scientists at the University of Vienna had looked at the studies that were submitted by corporations to regulatory authorities in Europe and found that I think it was there were 53 studies and only two of them were using modern methods of scientific research. Um, they were just outdated. They were using old methods. They didn't even include the most reliable tests for detecting cancer. So really the picture that came out of all this was well articulated by one of the judges. Um, and this was in the US court in San Francisco, Judge Chabria said that after looking at all the documents, strong evidence from which a jury could conclude that Monsanto does not particularly care whether its product is in fact giving people cancer, focusing instead on manipulating public opinion and undermining anyone who raises genuine and legitimate concern about the issue. So this is why we cannot trust and should not trust and can't leave it up to corporations to tell us what's safe or not about their products. And hard as this part is, but we need to find ways to reclaim the FDA, the EPA, and the government systems that are arbitrators for science and on what's safe for the public. Okay, now we're going to talk about co-opting academia. This is a big part of what Monsanto counted on. Um, the first, the very first thing that we um, did as an organization in 2015, our documents were became a New York Times front page story about how Monsanto and the other companies uh, relied on academics to fight the GMO labeling war. How academics that were on the payroll under the influence working directly with Monsanto were part of uh, a key part, the most important part of their public relations efforts to defend GMOs. Now this, this screen here, I just wanna show you the University of Florida donors. This is not online anymore. And it was at one time and we captured the screens. Then they took all this information out of the public eye and, and hid it. It's very difficult to find out from many universities how much money they're getting from corporations. And um, this is a, one of the key things that we say in the Merchants of Poison report is that the pesticide companies are not just following in the footsteps of big oil and big tobacco, but they helped write the playbook. And they've done it deliberately for decades, ever since they unleashed vicious attacks on Rachel Carson when she wrote Silent Spring. So the pesticide companies are well honed, and I think in some ways more effective at this point than oil industry and tobacco industry propaganda campaigns. And that's because of the influence and buy-in they have from the universities. And the land-grant university system in the U.S. was set up to study and research agriculture and food systems and was largely uh, or used to be a lot more government funded as government funding has gone down and corporate funding has gone up. These schools are so dependent on corporate funding to the point where there's really a chill even on debate of dissenting viewpoints. From what I've heard from students, from professors, from others who are in these academic institutions on topics like genetic engineering, on pesticides, it's just a full buy-in that this is the food system that we need to have. And behind that buy-in is a lot of corporate funding that is not always obvious. In the case of the University of Florida, we've got Syngenta as a gold, let's see, diamond donor was 10 million or more, or gold donors were a million, um, and silver donors were 100,000 or more. So well more than $10 million from pesticide companies in just one year. And the University of Florida also uh, had, these are just some of the headlines that came out to show that like the, a lot of this has been in the press. Um, 
and it does have a big impact when it is. So we've really tried to get our documents to mainstream reporters and um, and just as we can tell the story about the corporate influence in the background. So, um, yeah, we, so in the case of the University of Florida, and Florida actually has some of the strongest uh, sunshine or freedom of information laws. So it was uh, the first place that we got a lot of documents was from the University of Florida and from a professor named Kevin Folta who featured heavily in this New York Times front page articles about how academics were helping defeat GMO labeling. So we have lots of interesting stories and talk about them in the documents about how, about the back and forth between these professors. Um, but it was a really a well-coordinated system with academics, um, top uh, executives from pesticide companies and uh, public relations firms looped in in a pretty constant loop of conversation about um, talking points, lobbying priorities, um, in who to uh, attack, essentially, you know, lists of who the influencers are, who needed to be confronted, um, people like Bandana Shiva uh, or the Food Babe or Michael Pollan. Um, you know, these names all come up as uh, groups and people that needed to be confronted and um, and whose reach needed to be limited. And in, in some cases, they really uh, had some successes with that. So all of this, I think, is also leading up to a point of seeing like if it takes this much to keep the 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 the, the, the manufacture of knowledge about food systems, propped up. Uh, it's a system that is rotten. So I do take hope in kind of the extent to which they need to go to control the narrative, that when we're able to tell the truth, to either shine light on what's happening or tell a different story, um, those stories have incredible power and therefore are seen as an incredible threat to this corporate system. Okay, I, I have lots of stories in the report about academics, but I'm um, going to move on to the, the kind of how the third party game works. And third parties are sort of an innocuous sounding term for something that's really crucial. Um, one, uh, one fellow from a PR firm described it as putting your words in somebody else's mouth. So. If people don't trust Monsanto, Monsanto needs, cultivates, and purchases many, 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 many mouths to tell its story. So when the World Health Organization's Cancer Research Organization came out and said glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen, that was in 2015, March. Um, this was a document that was dated February 2015. It's just part of it. But at that point, before the report even came out, Monsanto had a full-blown public relations plan about how to push back on this scientific panel and all the ways that they would do it. So it's many pages. We have it linked on our website and in the report. Um, but you can see here just under strategies and tactics, um, before the report, came out, they were going to amplify particular studies that were good from their point of view. And here under point two, they're going to inform, inoculate, and engage industry partners. So they'll develop a toolkit with key information, talking points, um, identify any message shortcomings, get some blog posts up, Okay, so now we see here this next part where they lay out tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. It like looks really short, but that's actually a huge amount of financial power, megaphone power uh, across a wide swath of seemingly disconnected voices speaking on behalf of Monsanto's interests. 
So, you know, we went through this quite closely to try to understand who all these groups are. And for the report, we actually went through this and a, a few other Monsanto documents, and we pulled out just the groups that were named specifically um, and what their budgets were. So it's a lot of a lot of money going to controlling the narrative on food. But just to go through kind of what types of groups these are. So on tier one, you have trade associations. These are huge entities set up just to protect the commercial interests of that sector. So Crop Life International is devoted to defending pesticides. Uh, GMO Answers was a group that was cooked up by a public relations firm to get professors answering the public's questions about GMOs in a light that was favorable to Monsanto and the pesticides that go with the GMOs. So these are huge funded entities whose role it is to lobby. Then we get under tier two. These are your, your groups that are not so obviously connected to industry. In fact, they claimed in public to be independent, but documents show they were in some cases directly funded by Monsanto. Um, we had academics review, by a fortified sense about science, genetic literacy project, these kind of sciencey sounding groups um, that again claim to be independent, don't disclose fully their funding, um, and produce an amazing amount of content, sometimes multiple articles a day, defending and promoting pesticides and GMOs, always together. All the groups that we were fighting against with the GMO fight were all the groups that came forward to defend glyphosate. Then tier three, we have the entire food industry. So these very large, well-funded food front groups. They do in some cases uh, disclose their corporate funding, not always usually how much, but some of them disclose that they have corporate funding. And they have very large budgets, millions of dollars a year devoted to um, spinning food. We have a we had a predecessor to this report called Spinning Food that talks more about this, but um, ultra processed food is fine. Uh, artificial sweeteners are fine. Pesticides are fine. Nothing to see here. Don't worry your pretty little head. Um, a lot of them really do message specifically to women. Um, and often quite um, condescendingly. I, I didn't even put any slides in about that, but some of the images are really funny if you go and look in the report. Not so funny, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a very, um, there, there's a lot of effort that goes into how do we get moms and women um, feeling like conventional food is fine, organic food is not worth the money, don't bully us with your organic food talk, that sort of thing. That was a whole stream of this um, public relations effort. But so tier three was basically we're going to alert the food companies via this team that we have set up, which includes the trade association and two front groups for an inoculation strategy to educate them about science. And the way we're gonna educate them is to say, um, the levels of glyphosate are too low to matter and all of the science-based studies and people say that, but then there are these agenda-driven activist people who want you to think, including the world's preeminent scientists working on this uh, global independent science panel of cancer researchers, they are included in the agenda-driven activist framework. And so this whole document really explains that more about how they would position IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as an outlier, as activist-based science, as not real science, and so forth. Um, and then tier four, key growers associations. Those are your farming groups, farmers, ranchers, soy growers, corn growers, uh, tens of millions of dollars worth of um marketing coming out of those groups, some of it even taxpayer funded. So there you have in four tiers, an enormous army of helpers who are out in public telling us not to worry about glyphosate because Monsanto 
doesn't want us to worry. Just straight up with the talking points created by the company. So that, of course, has a huge effect. Um, here we see the money. Um, so again, we look just at groups that were directly named in, I think it was two or three different Monsanto documents. That was one of them. A couple of others. So $1.4 billion in budgets over five years. Now, a lot of these groups um, do other things besides defending glyphosate, but they all have pretty similar purpose or messaging. And the messaging is um, pesticides are fine, GMOs are necessary, don't worry about the processed food system, and also attacks on anyone who is criticizing uh, industrial food. So that's a lot of firepower, a lot of different voices that are all singing the same tune coming from all uh, over. And let's see, I have a little fish. There's my fish. Really, this is the effect of, of all of this. We're swimming in water we can't even see that is just saturated with corporate viewpoints on science, control over science, influence over how science is talked about from many, many, many people, entities, and groups that you would think, like to think and know uh, could and should do better. Okay, but first I got to do, and I'm, I'm going to do a couple more like see funny things from the documents that just show someone asked me the other day, do, do you know that these influential groups are connected right to Monsanto? What's the evidence? In some cases, the evidence is pretty clear. So this email is pertaining to a group called the American Council on Science and Health, which has been in operation since 1978, um, I think, communicating about science often in the media, but there's a lot of evidence and there has been for years that this group is just straight up funded by corporations to do product defense campaigns. And these documents came out in the Monsanto trials where you see, and this is a long string of email that is interesting to read, but it's, it's Monsanto executive talking amongst each other about whether they should work with this group, the American Council on Science and Health. Well, I know you're worried, they have plenty of warts, but you will not get a better value for your dollar. You just will not. Okay, and then this, this scientist actually shared, it was something like you know 50 posts, two reports, science briefs, all from this group, all defending and promoting GMOs and pesticides. Um, so just a tremendous amount of output. And he says here, they're already working to respond uh, against IARC. You also see in these emails, the guy from the American Council on Science and Health um, basically begging Monsanto for money, saying, we, we do so much for you. There's nobody else out there um, doing as much as we do. You know, we're already attacking IARC. And again, this is a you know, group of independent scientists who are trying to figure out what is causing cancer. Uh, we're already attacking them for this, that, and the other thing. You know, work with us. We want to work with you. They did end up funding them because we need all the friends that we can get. So you can see in the documents how nervous they were. And now the groups that I mentioned, as I said, those were the only ones that were directly named by name in the three or four Monsanto documents that we looked at specifically to, to name names of front groups, but it's so much bigger even than that. Um, many groups weren't named, but were just sort of referred to. Um, so it's, it's, this is, that was just a piece of the picture. But another example that helps kind of put in mind how, how big the scope um, was this intelligence report that came from Fleischman Hillard, which is a public relations firm to Monsanto. And so this is describing a campaign that was called Freedom to Farm. And Freedom to Farm, it was a classic, what we would call an AstroTurf campaign, so fake grassroots. 
freedom to farm was pretending to be farmers who were mad about the government trying to regulate glyphosate and they're going to protect glyphosate. And there's legions of farmers who are going to sign up for this thing. But behind that supposed farmer outrage was a pretty huge public relations campaign run by Fleischman Hiller. And so here you see that they have a, a, a current campaign team of 39 and a half full-time people in multiple countries. And in addition to these basically 40 full-time people, they had 56 trained operatives in the field recruiting for grassroots. So huge. They also talked in this document about fake websites that they would set up looking like farmer front groups. They were also closely, closely tracking all of the media, all of the influencers in all of these countries. So a massive campaign to keep the European Union from regulating glyphosate. And that fight is still ongoing. The European Union is considering ending uh, licensing for glyphosate. And it was a they were supposed to decide last year, but it got punted to early this year. Now it's been punted again to later this year. So this is still a very active fight happening in Europe. Here in the U.S., there's really not even any serious discussion about limiting or regulating glyphosate and many other chemicals. So we have one of the worst systems for being able to regulate even the worst known toxins. Okay. So there's our fish and water. Okay. Now I'll take a breath. Okay. There's two more um, themes that I want to talk about. Two more tactics in the playbook that are front and center with the way the pesticide industry runs its business and really obvious in the way that they uh, try to defend and protect glyphosate. And so the first I want to talk about is tracking and attacking scientists, journalists, and influencers. And there's a lot of evidence on these themes. These are documents pertaining to my group, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, because Monsanto had an entire public relations campaign to deal just with us, and there were only three of us. So the level of detail and concern, again, is like quite amazing to step back and look at it. But before I get to explaining that, I just wanted to say that the attacks on scientists were unprecedented. Um, some Folks who looked, some reporters who reported on this. Um, there was a, an award winning series in Le Monde, which is France's biggest paper, in which they described, these reporters described how Monsanto's campaign to try to destroy uh, the United Nations Cancer Research Program. It was just an all out attack on this group of independent scientists. Um, others called it unprecedented, extremely harsh. Um, I had reporters comment to me like it they re this really is like something I haven't seen before a, a triangulation on an entire scientific panel but also basically scientific system of um independent science uh and precautionary approach thinking about science like how can we study the hazards of chemicals to understand what might be causing cancer this is just an incredibly crucial area of research and it's threatening to companies so they really went all out to try to um personally <laughs> attack scientists and also uh gun for the scientific panel itself I'll talk a little bit about that here, but I'm also I'm going to be giving a whole talk about that in a couple of weeks um, on a webinar. I'll also be tweeting about that. So follow me at Stacey Malkin if you want the uh, info on that. But I'm going to be appearing on that panel with uh, David Carpenter, who is a scientist who was recently um, 
basically thrown out of his office at the University of Albany for nine months because Monsanto was going after him because he testifies in trials about the horrific harm of PCB chemicals, which are a decades long scandal still in the environment, still in people's bodies. Um, and I've had people say to me recently, get a lot of trolls on Twitter, um, many of you also probably do, um, but people will say, well, Monsanto doesn't even exist anymore, and you're still talking about them like they're just, you know, trying to make a villain out of them. But I say, well, just a month ago, there's legal documents with Monsanto lawyers going after this scientist. So their name is still, the, the, the entity is still very much there, still suing people. Um, this fellow was thankfully reinstated to his job at the University of Albany, and he says, I'm just going to keep doing this work. I, I will not be silenced. And the panel will be moderated by Tyrone Hayes, who is a scientist at UC Berkeley, um, recently elected to the National Academy of Sciences, which is really an, an awesome victory and success story for someone who was at one time just ruthlessly attacked by Syngenta over his work on atrazine and um, gender bending effects in frogs, basically. So if you want to hear more about the dirty details of how they attack scientists, um, that is coming up May 23rd, and you can find the info on my Twitter. Okay, so tracking and attacking scientists, journalists, and influencers. Um, these were documents coming from their, uh, from two different campaigns they had going. One was the U.S. Right to Know FOIA Communications Plan, 31-page document as to how uh, 11 Monsanto employees, two PR firms were going to deal with three of us working at U.S. Right to Know. That's how threatening what we were doing was. And what we were doing was um, trying to get documents from public universities, government entities through freedom of information laws to understand how uh, the pesticide and biotech industries run their business. So that's threatening to them. It said our, right in the document that our plan will impact the entire industry. Um, so their pitch was, therefore, the entire industry needs to come together and fight it. So they had a whole plan for that. Part of their plan was uh, this fusion center. Fusion center is a term that came out of Homeland Security. Of, um, and, uh, and so it's something that that's sort of new or recent in corporations where um, they're hiring, in some cases, ex-military people to staff these war rooms, basically, to understand everything that's going on in the internet and who's saying what. Um, so this is very close tracking and monitoring of um, digital properties, what people say in public. We see in the documents, the Fusion Center was like um, watching videos of people who were going to come, a, teen, a teenager who was going to come to a Monsanto um, shareholder meeting and talk about her concerns about GMOs. So there, you see them talking about people's personalities and how to deal with them and how much money they're raising and just like everything we need to know about friends and foes of pesticides. We've got it. They actually got um, a find in France. Bayer did for the the lists that they kept of influencers because they they had violated some data privacy laws, which are very much stronger in France than they are here. So, okay, to, so and one, there was a grid about social media responses. So you can see they had a plan, even for one tweet from my boss. What would they do if my boss sends one tweet? Um, well, they weren't gonna worry much about that, but if it started to escalate, 10 tweets an hour, 25 tweets, 50 tweets from different sources. Now we're really getting worried. At some point, they would initiate an emergency meeting of the steering committee. This was leaders from all the pesticide firms to decide what to do about these tweets. So y'all keep tweeting if you have criticism because it's apparently very effective. Um, again, I think this just gets to, to the the level of concern about the real truth about health and why conferences like this are so important. The last document here I wanted to point to is Project Spruce, Carrie Gillum book. So Carrie Gillum was our third at this time um, 
person at U.S. Right to Know. She's written two books about um, Monsanto's herbicide business. The most recent one was called um, The Monsanto Papers. And for 25 years, she was a reporter with Reuters and stationed in Kansas and really like reported. I, th I think she's one of the top reporters in the world covering pesticide issues and especially with a, a knowledge about glyphosate. So when she came out with her first book, which was called Whitewash, um, they were really worried about it and they had a whole PR plan to deal with her. What's interesting about this is here they are talking about engaging their pro-science front groups. They name them. All many of those groups claiming to be independent. They're also planning to engage their regulatory friends via their regulatory teams at the EPA in Europe. I mean, so and basically what this they were doing was trying to write negative reviews on Amazon, trying to discredit the book generally, you know, develop their talking points, all the things. So super. Um, worried about a reporter, a tweeting, tweeter, a book, uh, a group of three people. So, you know, we, we generally take that as a sign when we start to get attacked by the industry trolls that we're onto something and we should <laughs> dig harder and speak louder about whatever that thing is, because there's something here that um, needs to be in the light of day. So one more, one slide here on attacks on the science panel, just so you can see how, and I wanna, and this is a group that to me, at the end of uh, my report, I really felt that they're a key piece of the story of, of, of what we found when we dug through all the documents to explain how they did their playbook. And Genetic Literacy Project is, Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, it's It's been around since, well, I think it's been a, a, a big project since about 2015 when the industry started to really get serious about trying to win the public over on GMOs. It's run by a guy who's for 20 years been you know, attacking anyone who talks about chemical risk. His name's John Entime. And they have incredible, I don't know why, in some circles, legitimacy. You know, they did partnerships with University of Florida and UC Davis. At one point, UC Davis was giving them um, office space. They were letting John Entine uh, teach science courses. Um, it's a group that said they were independent, but a long history of and documents started to come out showing they partnered directly with Monsanto on this, that, and the other. And they really have this very aggressive attack strategy. And these attacks are coming in some cases from straight up climate science denialists. So here's a group that claims to be pro-science. Um, they describe themselves as pro-science. Uh, the Monsanto papers describe them as pro-science. They're pro-science friends and front groups. Um, or friends in this case, they, they, they recently uh, bear is now on record as funding this group directly. But for a long time, they said they didn't take corporate funding. So here's just an example of the kind of like hysterical headlines. This cancer agency is full of corruption, distortion, fraud. These independent scientists studying the causes of cancer are in it for personal profit and ideological vanity. They lied to Congress. Um, corruption, secrecy, activist group, insults upon insults of individual scientists and the group. So this was the aggressive front group strategy. Front group in the middle connected to lots of entities in um, food, public relations, in university um, departments, genetic engineering. Um, there are some documents with them talking with the U.S. government about government-sponsored programs and videos. Um, that basically teach scientists and activists to promote and defend chemicals and GMOs in the ways that these groups are teaching. And one 
case, this guy was outright teaching a three day, they called it a boot camp um, to teach journalists and scientists how to promote and defend GMOs. So a front group that full on attacks cancer researchers in the voices of climate science denialists, yet has the platform of prestigious universities and the US government. That's the story of Genetic Literacy Project. And that's why I say in some ways, this guys, these guys have it going better than even the tobacco industry and even the fossil fuel industry in terms of the legitimacy that they um, do not deserve and yet somehow have. So, okay, that this I just point out whenever I can to show they're actually quite closely tied to the climate science denialists, but they're also, as you'll see in the next slide, like dominating the Google news search. And I've done this sort of a search many times, more times than I would care to admit over the last few years, and it's often the same. We do it with new browsers and new computers, doesn't matter. So it's not a, a tracking history thing. Um, they are often, very often, at the top of the Google News search for on any given day for topics of importance to the pesticide industry. So it might be, for example, like Mexico is trying to ban GMOs and glyphosate. Big uproar. If you search for Mexico and GMOs on that day, up comes a whole bunch of articles from the Genetic Literacy Project. So we've done this with various sources, cancer and glyphosate pesticides in food, GMOs in Africa. And you'll see they're not just the first on the second, but the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth hits on Google News, like again and again. So how do they do that? Um, you know, we've studied it quite a bit. It has to do with the amount of content they put out, the way they do their SEO, lots of uh, effort and money, no doubt, going to that. Um, it's really pretty much coloring outside the lines quite a bit as far as I can tell, because what they also do is they um, take mainstream news articles about these topics, say Bloomberg or um, the New York Times has a P or even me, I've had articles, they just rip them off and post them on Genetic Literacy Project. And he'll reach out to me and say, is it okay if I republish your piece? Say no. And then he says, well, too bad. And uh, up it goes. So they're, they're saying that they have fair use of the articles, but what they will also do is change the headline, change the image, all very SEO friendly, um, condense the paragraph, condense the entire article to key paragraphs that really help bolster certain talking points um, that are useful to the pesticide industry. And then they will intersperse some of these articles with you know, their own disclaimers and editor's notes. So you'll see, for example, and I wrote about this in the report, but they posted um, a press release from the California Attorney General, which was essentially arguing that glyphosate should be labeled as a carcinogen, but uh, the, a judge stopped that from happening in California. Um, and so the Attorney General writes a press release about that. And right after the beginning of the paragraph under his name with his byline is a big disclaimer that like nobody agrees with this guy or you know nobody agrees with California or whatever you get the point it's just like talking points um and narrative promotions throughout articles that they're ripping straight off from other publications so in this way they stay constantly atop the Google search. And I think this kind of thing is something that the environmental health movement journalists um, need to get a lot better at seeing and confronting and figuring out how to deal with. Because of course, most of us are getting our at least you know research path from going to Google News or Google um, and there's lots of studies that most people only look at the first few or the first page and then like nothing else on the internet matters. So, you know, there's lots coming down the pike and we just scratched the surface of it with our report about new media, um, the new media information battle. 
uh, and now with AI and <laughs> um, videos that can be doctored so easily, it's like really going to be interesting to figure out how to get a handle on disinformation, um, uh, how to keep the record straight, get the truth out, um, challenge corporate power abuse, which is, is I would consider this example to be. Um, and yeah, if anyone has ideas on how to do that with Google News and in this particular example, I would love to hear it. And I think so part of that is what can we do collectively, but to bring it back to, there's a whole lot we can also do individually um, in the sense of understanding the scope of this and how companies come at our thought systems um, and how we can understand that when we see it, how we can do our due diligence on research to understand um, who's behind a group like the Genetic Literacy Project. What's the motivation of the type of information they share? How is it that a huge bully literally bully who attacks scientists and scientific research as an institution, uh, how do they get legitimacy on platforms like Google News and UC Davis and the US government? And how can we challenge that? So lots of questions for us. <laughs> um, and I'm will admittedly say I'm big on understanding the problem and it, it's a lot harder to figure out what do we do for a solution. Um, we do offer lots of thoughts on that um, in the Merchants of Poison report about how it's important to challenge the media, to be in touch with media, to um, deal with scientific journals, um, to demand transparency at universities. Um, <laughs> really, basically, wherever in any of us sit in our work lives or in the economy, there's something we can do to challenge the narratives that are coming at us, look deeper into where they're coming from, what are the motivations, and encourage others to really get trained up in media literacy, however we can do it, and to share those tools and resources with each other. At the, for the closing here, and I want to leave some time for questions, so I'm just going to tell one more story that brings us back to the Proposition 37 uh, ballot initiative to label GMOs. So that was the first of four attempts to get voters to agree that we should label GMOs. And at that time, and every poll was consistent, most people agreed. Most people want to know what's in their food. Most people, no matter what their political persuasion, uh, believe in transparency, believe in having the information that we need to make the decisions for ourselves about what we eat and feed our families. Now, there was a huge effort against those campaigns. And we tracked at one point, this was in a report that my colleague Gary wrote called CD Business. Um, who was funding, it was Monsanto in the lead, but there was a very long list. I only have here everyone that donated over a million dollars. So you see all your pesticide companies, Dow, Syngenta, BASF, the grocery manufacturers, lots of processed food companies are straight in with the pesticide companies on the industrial food chain. The whole system is of one piece. <laughs> from the GMO, pesticide, corn, and soy, monocultures, industrial commodity crops uh, that are in most of the time not being used to feed people. They're being used primarily to feed cows, animal feed, cars, through biofuels, and also processed food factories. So I want to put a radar up here about we're hearing lots of messages from Food companies, pesticide companies, entities like the Gates Foundation, governments in some cases, lots of investors, huge funded groups, all telling us that 
cell cultured meats and processed foods are the key to solving climate change. I think that's hugely problematic for a lot of reasons, but the primary one being that we know very clearly through the science, and you've heard a lot about it at this conference, I'm sure, that ultra processed food is one of the main harms to our health. It linked to all sorts of things from cardiac problems to early death for a very strong body of science. And so ultra processed foods and the way in they're being presented as a climate solution is just a way to greenwash the system we already have and somehow make the claim that by doubling down on this system, we can feed people when we can't feed them now and fix the climate when we're when the system is currently making it worse. So there's a lot of magical thinking involved in if we just, you know, build huge factories for processed foods, we're going to fix these problems. It's just another pipeline for the industrial commodity crop GMO pesticide food system. What are we going to do with all that corn and soy, cows, cars and ultra processed food factories? Okay, so that's the system we're fighting against. I wanted to end with a little bit of good news. So I mentioned that the the lines reversed on this the the graph from hell um, <laughs> to where we actually won on election day. So in other words, the green line went up and the red line went down and they crossed. But unfortunately, we didn't win enough votes to make up for the votes we lost in early voting. So we still lost the ballot initiative by, I think it was 1.5 percentage points. But the green line went back up. And, and how that happened was, I think, one of the most fascinating stories that I've seen in this field of that I've been doing this, which is now way too long, <laughs> ready, ready to move on to new things. But I think there's a lesson here in, in, in how that happened, how that green line went back up. And that was that we... We had raised enough money on the Yes campaign to advertise for 10 days. And so we started advertising and on TV, and that's what caused the line to go back up. Back up. But the, the what we would advertise was a big source of, of course, arguments and debates and robust discussions. Um, because there were, it was one 30 second ad. And what can you do in 30 seconds? Well, you certainly can't explain everything that I just took an hour and 15 minutes to explain. You really don't have time to say very much. So the plan for how we were going to decide on what 30 second ad um, was down to focus group testing. They called them dial tests. And it was hundreds of people looked at a bunch of different ads that the campaign had produced. We had done video ads and we hadn't actually run anything on TV, but a lot of ads were produced that were running online. There were ads talking about the evils of pesticides. There were celebrity ads with Danny DeVito and lots of well-known celebrities saying to vote for Prop 37. There were anti-Monsanto, Monsanto Agent Orange, you know, sort of dark evil entity ads. Um, so seven or eight different ads were run through this test. And the idea was that people would respond emotionally with this dial that they had to whether they were positively or negatively associating with certain messages and certain ads and then on, on all these different criteria. And then at the end, they would put together the winning messages into one new ad. So they ran through this process and a lot of people were super excited about the celebrity ad, the anti-pesticide ad. We've got to tell people in 30 seconds, like all the bad that is happening with this industry. Um, but when they ran the test, they the consultants came back and said, we are really surprised by these results, but there was one ad that outperformed all the other ads in all the all of the categories, so much so that we just like have to use this ad and it's not even a question. The theme of the ad was food is love. Um, and it was an ad that came from a woman that I had interviewed uh, for the campaign who said, you know, I don't want to see all these images of food 
on your website. Like I want to see people. Food is about people. Food is love. Food is my family connecting with me. And I just thought that was a truth. That was like a real truth about health and life, that food is a way that we connect with each other through love. And with that message, food is love, a mom serving her family food, and we have a right to know what's in it, was so successful that not only did our green line shoot back up, but at the end of the entire four campaigns, um, where, as I pointed out in the previous slide, um, Monsanto and the food company spent over $100 million, including the best polling money can buy, the best messaging experts. They <laughs> released a new ad campaign. They had business cards, they had ads, and it was in the theme was food is love. So what a couple of women moms could come up with, you know, it was no match for all of the corporate PR teams trying to figure out how to convince us what we want for our food system. And that part gives me so much hope. And it's why I do the work that I do, because shining light on these systems, understanding them, and just speaking the truth in the face of them, it always wins. It carries so much power, so much power that the companies have to implement all of these tricks spend all of the money, do all of the dirty deeds that I just talked about, just to confront the truth. So for all of us here, and, and that's why I love this conference, speaking the real truth about health is the most powerful thing we can do. And we just will all got to keep doing it louder and braver and stronger. So may we all speak about the real truth and food is love. And we need to change our food system to love our planet and our families. Thank you all so much. And I'm done and I'm gonna take a break and let people ask me questions. I can't hear you, Michael. Oops, sorry about that. Thank you, Stacey, for that very powerful presentation. That was, uh, th that last story was was definitely uh, inspiring. So, um, so we're gonna begin our our question and answer session with the audience um and before i do just want uh, you know i guess you're pointing out all the various places that uh that they can find you and, and find out uh more about uh all of your work and, and the projects that you're working on um where can they get your book so this is so merchants of poison is actually a report that's free online for anyone um merchants of poison I do have the URL, but it's not operational yet. It's at usrtk.org on the homepage, or you can go to bit.ly slash merchants of poison, um, print it out. I also have all of the chapters of it on our website. So it's in HTML, lots of documents, tons of links. There's over, I think, 500 footnotes. Um, everything is just like, you know, tied to a document um, and to a, a reputable source. So it's just very, very well researched and footnoted. Um, so yeah, and you can find it at usrtk.org. And please, please sign up for our newsletter. Um, I should also say for those interested, we're doing a major investigation into the origins of COVID. And we've um, put into the public a lot of documents about the debates going on between scientists you know, what they were saying behind the scenes versus what was said in public. Um, a really important story about how we can um, protect ourselves against the next pandemic. So lots of good reporting. And we put out our uh, news from our investigation every week in a newsletter, along with some of the best public health news in science that is emerging, which is a lot like daily, we have new science coming out, pointing out the links between the environment and products we use and our health. Thank you for sharing that information. So we're now going to begin our live Q and A session. Um, but we, uh, so um, what I'm going to explain exactly how it works. We don't take questions directly from chat. What we will do is have people raise their hands virtually. If you're not sure how to do this, what you need to do is click on the reactions button at the bottom right of the Zoom window, and then <laughs> click on the raise hand from the menu that pops up. When I call your name, I will unmute you and ask you to state where you're from and to ask your question. 
we ask that everyone keep their questions brief and, and on topic. So with that said, I'm going to take a question from the audience here, and that's going to come from uh, Bin Wu. Bin Wu, please stay away from and ask your question. Yeah, hi, hello, and thank you for your great, uh, the, the best uh, the lecture for me. Um, I'm from the Maryland. So my question is, um, I thought you have, you talk about the sunlight is about the best, uh, this, um, this uh, infectator, the sunlight. But how can we use this sunlight to, um, because, um, if we got the too much sunlight, we, we will get the skin cancer. <laughs> so how can how can we, we use this sunlight to uh, to protect us to get a benefit from the sunlight? <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so this is a good idea to use sunscreen. And if you're going to use sunscreen, you can a really great. This is another topic that I've worked on, which was chemicals and personal care products. But then I'll get to your question, which is, I think, a bigger than this. But just to mention that um, sunscreens are, are often toxic or don't work. So a really good resource to find the best sunscreens is Environmental Working Group's sunscreen um, report that they do every year. But on, on the topic just of sunlight in general, it's I just truly believe that transparency is so important for all the work we do. Let's just put it out, put the facts out into the light and let's have a real debate How and many? see where it goes. I mean, there's so much, for example, on the COVID-19 origins example, like scientists just really didn't think the public should be involved in questioning where did the pandemic come from. And I just think that's really wrong and really dangerous. So we need to be having um, a public discussion about what is known in the science and what the facts are. Yeah, how many hour? How many hour uh, can we get the sunlight every day or just? <laughs> well, you mean like actual sunlight? Yeah, actually, um, that's yeah. I don't. I think some sunlight is good, but you don't want too much. <laughs> All right. I'm not really an expert on that topic, but yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you very because much. Uh, All right. So. Um, so you mentioned the uh, the Gates Foundation, and, and I know you've done you know work into that. Uh, you talked about um, it's um, about their interventions into Africa. What kind of stuff is is the Gates Foundation doing in Africa, and uh, what what is concerning about it? Yeah, well, the Gates Foundation is a of course a super powerful organization, uh, one of the biggest philanthropy organizations in the world, and one of the leading funders of uh, development dollars to Africa around agriculture. So they've spent about, I think, almost $6 million on agricultural development. And unfortunately, it's all, um, almost all of it programs to expand industrial agriculture. And Africa is one of the last, you know, huge land masses. And of course, we're talking about many, many countries uh, that haven't shifted to industrially industrial commodity crops systems, basically. Lots of people still um, doing traditional farming, growing variety of foods. And the Gates Foundation's programs are really aimed at transitioning that, uh, expanding industrial, larger farms, growing corn and soy, farms that depend on fertilizers, which are harming the climate, on pesticides, uh, which are causing lots of health and environmental problems to grow corn and soy, which as I said earlier, not the food that's feeding people, um, but it's you know for the market, which, which often means cows, cars, and ultra processed food factories. So they're pushing this system over the objections of many, many groups, farmers, agroecology movements, faith leaders in Africa, who have for years been trying to raise objections to the foundation ignored, dismissed. There's no accountability, no transparency. Um, there's just sort of like a dogma. A uh, uh, bill says it's good, so it must be good kind of. Um, that's the system. <laughs> it's really problematic in so many ways. And as you said, I've done a lot of reporting on it. Uh, USRTK.org, we have a section on Bill Gates that talks about um, 
Gates' investments and his climate perspectives and what the foundation's doing, particularly in Africa. Um, so lots of reporting there, and we have a new report coming out soon. So more to be said on that. And a little closer to home, he's buying a lot of farmland in the United States. It's been reported. Um, what, what, why is he doing that? And why should we be concerned with that? So, yeah, he's one of the largest private farmland owners in the U.S. Why he He's very clear about why he did it when on Reddit. People asked him on Reddit. He said, because my investment firm told me to. It's a good investment. If you're looking through all of what Bill is doing, um, investments and also philanthropically, it's a wealth maximization model. It's like what's good for the investors, what's good for my investments, what's good for my friends, what's good for patents and intellectual property rights is what is going to feed the world. <laughs> and the data, though, doesn't back that up. But they're not looking at the data that's not supporting what they do. And, and, and he also, of course, has a lot of influence over media. Um, so there's not a lot of people criticizing Bill Gates, um, and especially in the U.S. There, there is quite a bit of um, pushback in the African press. And I just recently saw that the Gates Foundation was putting a lot of money into paying journalists in Africa. So they're really trying to paper over the facts to keep the system going that's working for them versus listen to the people and the farmers who live in Africa uh, and who are saying they want something different. And the reason it's a problem is, you, yeah, we don't want Bill Gates owning all the farmland in the U.S. Some people think, well, maybe he's going to do something amazing with it. But he, he said himself, it's, it's an investment. I'm doing it because I can get a return on my investment. And the way they do that is by growing corn, soy, or monocultures of something. And I think actually I read recently growing potatoes and selling them to McDonald's as French fries in the case of some of the Gates land that he owns in the U.S. You, you, touched, you um, briefly just touched on, on the media. What is the media's role in, um, in either preventing or uh, preventing the, your type of message and, and amplifying? Mm -hmm message of uh of um these these bad actors oh the media is so important and i know a lot of us are mad at the media and mad at certain publications but it, even say, to take a publication like the new york times they do quite a bit that is upsetting but they also do some really important reporting that makes a difference when they do it um i mentioned the the professor at University of Albany who was sidelined for nine months because Monsanto was suing him. I talked with him the other day and said, how did that turn around? Why are you back in your office now? And he said, the media wrote about it. There were three stories on the front page of the paper and now I'm back in my job. So it's just, it, it gets to the sunlight aspect. It's really important to shine light on things that are happening and to have media do it. Of course, they're very influenced. Um, by corporate funding, pharmaceutical funding, agrochemical industry funding. So we don't hear a lot of stories that desperately need to be reported. Um, or we don't maybe get the full story, even in the New York Times expose. And that's why independent media is so important. And we're trying to do that at US Right to Know. So we do, we get documents and we both, we give them to media, we pitch them to media, we write academic papers about them. And then we also write about documents ourselves. So it's kind of a, a new model. Thank you. Uh, our next question is coming from Deborah. Please where you're from and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So first of all, uh, thank you, um, Stacy. This was an amazing presentation that you did. And um, I'm really glad that I was listening in on this today, this afternoon. I'm, I'm actually from Massachusetts, but I'm currently down south in Florida enjoying the sunshine. <laughs> and um, um, as far as chemicals go, um, you mentioned about sunscreen and there being importance for it. Um, I, I could probably put a little debate on that, but I was just wondering, have you done any research on the chemistry of sunscreen um, and possibly the factor that it's being like everything else is being fear upon us and and fear of being in the sun and the reason why i asked that is because um 
you know, for millennia, we've been exposed to the sun in uh, many, uh, you know, without sunscreen, this just became a marketing thing. And maybe it's the industry uh, marketing fear of sunshine. And, um, you know, for people who normally don't go in the sun at all, especially if they're on a plant-based diet uh, from what we're learning all uh, learning here, perhaps they would, you know, start off by going, you know, five or 10 minutes at a time and working up gradually with their sunshine exposure. But so my question basically is, have you done any research on uh, the chemicals and the fact that maybe the um, this is a lot of fear hate to use the word porn, but <laughs> fear porn on humanity to um, uh, be afraid of the sun and that the um, the possibility that sun exposure is not the reason why we get uh, people get skin cancer. I think there's certainly something to that. I mean, I we could talk about that for a long time. Um, there's definitely something to fear porn, an example um, is, is disinfectants, right? Like you can see companies really worked hard. There was a whole marketing campaign to convince people that they needed uh, disinfectants. Now, maybe that's a different commercial, different situation after COVID, but it, you know, at one point the FDA came out and said, you know, triclosan and these antibacterial soaps are not even any better than regular soap. So it was just marketing to sell a product. I think <laughs> there is a similar in um, the sun situation. I see some new moms like coating babies from head to toe. I never did that. Now my son refuses to use it at all. Um, I do think there are some better ingredients than others. Zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, not in nano form, but just regular natural form, which is tends to be the chalky kind of white, which people don't like. But if I'm going to use anything, I use that. Um, but even better than that, to use a hat, stay out of the sun or just in small doses, like you said. But I think it's really good to have a radar up about, do I need this product before we buy anything? And a lot of times the answer is, no. And with personal care products, you know, there's just so many things, bubble bath, air freshener, um, you know, a lotion for every part of your body. It's just like sell, sell, sell fragrances for boys, fragrances for babies. They're just always trying to sell us something. And a lot of times it's like just putting petrochemicals on our skin that are not healthy for us. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Evelyn. Evelyn, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'd like you to talk about um, the trials that in which the uh, uh, the people were awarded millions and millions of dollars uh, linking pesticides to lymphoma. So I, in my media, I saw a lot of headlines about the money. And mm -hmm. I didn't see so much detail about the cancer uh, connection. So did um, Monsanto manage to keep burying that part of the headline? I mean, how come uh, how come everyone is not screaming lymphomas being caused by pesticides? I mean, one of the speakers said there's 100,000 people in the United States that now have lymphoma. So how come their stories aren't being heard? How come the whole dollar amount was the headline and and mm. the link to cancer didn't get the media coverage yeah that's a good question um well it's over a hundred thousand people are suing uh, monsanto over having non-hodgkin's lymphoma i think the number of people who have it are is much higher but the evidence is i mean they they were able to convince several juries that the evidence was strong enough that uh, glyphosate Roundup what wasn't just pesticides in general, but glyphosate based Roundup, which you know you can buy at Home Depot. Many people put on their lawns, <clears throat> is linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and also that Monsanto failed to warn people about the risks. And so there were several large jury awards. There was um, Lee Johnson was the first, and he was a, a groundskeeper in um, California. 
And then a couple I mentioned earlier who both had non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and uh, there was one or two other big awards. Um, and now Monsanto has won several trials in a row. So it's a fight over um, this question that you're raising. Does it cause cancer? And a lot of people in the scientific field are saying yes, and not only that, but there's a lot of other health problems associated with glyphosate and it's only one pesticide among many. So, you know, why the news spins it as money? That's a good question because it's, people don't like to, yeah, it's because it's a, it's, it's a version of hiding the truth. Thank you. So um, you also have another article on your website that talk, talks, about sci, um, talks about scientists complaining about regulatory capture, about the government institutions, um, basically working for the corporations. Can you can you talk about the, the government perspective? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of unfortunate stories about the pressure that Monsanto and their allies put on the U.S. government to keep saying glyphosate safe. Um, at one point, there was a scientist in the EPA who was, they were sort of laughing about how he would stop another government agency from doing a study. Um, you know, I think like with anything, and again, we're talking about these huge institutions, there are many good scientists within these institutions, but the political aspect of it, um, where new leaders come in, um, people are fired, uh, new, you know, our, our, our <laughs> funders of our campaigns are going to get the priority. There's just a lot of politics involved in how the US government deals with risk. And I think the bottom line is you can't, we can't trust what the government or what the companies are telling us about what's safe. This is true in food, pesticides, personal care products. Like we have to take it upon ourselves to read the labels. It, like we shouldn't have to do this work. We shouldn't have to be scientists to eat or use products, but we we do need to sort of take down that veil of uh, believing that someone else is going to protect us or believing someone else is looking out for this for us. And we just have to, you know, find the sources that we can trust, share information with each other, look at labels, look behind the stories and, and ask questions. Thank you. You um, have an article about Coca-Cola's efforts to influence the CDC on diet and obesity. What, what kind of, uh, <laughs> what, uh, you know, games do they, do they play and what is that about? Well, obesity is a public health crisis, and it's also a, a corporate corruption crisis. It's about our, a food system that needs to change. But what Coca-Cola wants to do, and they do this in lots of ways, is put the responsibility on you, the person who ate too much, and that's why you're obese, instead of, we need to get all of the sugar out of our food system. We need to tax sugary products, however we do it policy-wise. Um, sugar is a massive public health crisis, and Coca-Cola, of course, has a lot of vested interests in um, changing the, the topic <laughs> away from them, shifting the blame onto this personal responsibility frame. And, and just to sort of tie that back to like a system and institution like the Gates Foundation, like they're major investors in Coca-Cola through Berkshire Hathaway, which was also a major investor in the Monsanto Bayer merger. And by the way, he also invests in kidney dialysis machines. So all of this is profitable to have an unhealthy food system that's making people sick that you can sell pharmaceuticals for. And the people making money on this system also funding charity is problematic in lots of ways. Thank you. So, um, next question is, um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, uh, that's also corporate capture with regard to, um, the nutrition profession. Is that, you had some writing on that. Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah. So the American, um, so the, the, the nutrition, the nutritionists and dietitians, the people in hospitals that, you know, serve us food, uh, this is a, a, an important group of influencers that companies have a lot of um, stake in, in, in how they talk to people about health and nutrition. And unfortunately, what we found with the Academy, which is the largest professional org of nutritionists and dietitians, is that they have corporate partnerships. They um, 
at times, you know, message in ways that are good for their corporate partners. They're not going to be telling you to the, the, the big, huge problem that ultra processed food and sugar and pesticides can be for our health. So it's, it's very much like, well, it's captured, <laughs> like you said in the headline. And my colleague Gary did uh, some academic studies about that where we showed the documents and the sponsorships and how much money they're getting from which companies. Um, and they were very mad about that when we publicized it, but we we believe in getting this stuff out into the sunlight. So yeah, there's a lot on our website. You can look under our academic research to see um, his work on the, the nutritionists and also Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola's influence on public health conferences um, journalists, the way studies are done. There, there's a lot to it. And it's a lot of what I talked about uh, in my talk, just the many, many multiple astonishing array of ways that companies are trying to control how we think about what we eat. Okay, thank you. And um, you mentioned a little bit about uh, independent media. Can you name some outlets that um, that you believe uh, are are trusted outlets and, and allies to um, getting the truth out about this this whole you know this whole issue of uh, of lies being perpetrated on on uh, on the people? So yeah, lots of good outfits. I'm going to say usrtk.org first, US Right to Know. We're reporting as much as we can and um, aspire to grow and report more about these public health issues. Um, the Intercept has done amazing work um, on a lot of corporate scandals around pesticides and chemicals. Um, I think also some reporters at the New York Times the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal even are doing good reporting on certain topics, COVID-19 origins. Um, there was a big piece in Vanity Fair about that, the New Yorker. So I think that there's good reporting in a lot of the mainstream pubs still, but you, but not all of it is good reporting. Um, who else? I've, I've been following a lot of sub stacks for, for individual writers. I, I think that's great if you have a particular interest. Um, I'm excited about the possibility for writers to reach larger audiences through those sorts of formats. Um, yeah, journalism is in crisis. There's no doubt about that. And um, environmentalhealthnews.org is a, a source that I use a lot. GM Watch out of the UK is doing some really good reporting on GMOs. Um, follow Gary Ruskin at Gary Ruskin on Twitter. He's great at tweeting really crucial public health news that's coming out from all different sources. But if he's tweeting about it, it's, a, it's usually a really important reporting from a good source. So we're trying to track and help people find through our Twitter and our newsletter what we consider to be the best reporting. Do you find that people are becoming the general public is becoming more aware of these issues or is is are they so successfully um, keeping the information from the public that uh, the general public, is, you know, isn't really like waking up? I think you know there are there is a sense, I think, in some circles that yeah. people are waking up. But they tend to be the same, you know, this kind of preaching <laughs> fire, like when you're you know, you have people talking to their own friends. So yeah, the, yeah. Uh, I wonder that a lot. We could talk about that all day. I think people are waking up. I think people are waking up in lots of ways. That's why organic food sales have been rising, fastest growing sector of food. Um, I think a lot of people are on a healing path. A lot of people are waking up to, okay, the doctor is not necessarily going to give me the answer. The government is not necessarily going to protect me. And so they're finding communities of support online through conferences like this, through lots of groups you know, mom communities online, finding their way together. I think also where people are feeling pretty overwhelmed right now. I mean, it's incredible overwhelm of information and especially since COVID. Uh, it, so that's a challenge. How do we keep ourselves motivated and focused, if, if, fight the distraction? you know, figure out the one thing we can do to make this world a brighter and better place and do it without the distractions. May we all find a way to do that, myself included. 
And you kind of touched on, you know, we need solutions. And you, you mentioned, you know, you ended on on a very positive note um, with the, with the story of how these these this small group of mothers were able to mm -hmm. out message, you know, <laughs> yeah, the the large corporations. Um, are, is there any other examples, or do, is there anybody doing this right that you see that could be modeled after? And are there any countries that have been successful at staving mm -hmm. off? types of uh, misinformation attacks? Well, you know, I think this is also like a new, a new day for that question. Like, how are we going to stand up in the face of AI and the digital takeover of all of our spaces? Um, I just think people know the truth. They feel the truth. They can feel the truth in our bodies. And when you feel that and know it, trust it, share it, speak it, find ways. Um, I've personally have been getting a lot of, uh, a lot of motivation and support from TikTok. <laughs> and the reason is because there's a lot of, you know, my age women just talking, just saying their stories. So I, it's those personal stories of your experience. If you found healing, if you found a, a teacher, if you found health, you know, share that, um, it's, it's, people are desperate for those stories that connect them connect us person to person. So although it's hard sometimes, a lot of times to do this work, I do find a lot of reason also for hope, but it's mostly just in one-on-one -on -one or many in one or conferences like this. And you know, again, I wish we were in the same room together. Maybe someday <laughs> we'll get back to that. But in the meantime, here we are connected. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And do you do you find that there's a you know uh, you know like d trust about you know the government institutions and and corporations et cetera has has gone down? Do you find um, that that is is helpful in um, in speaking to people about this type of issue? Absolutely, and in fact, I would say you know a lot of conservatives are follow my work. They really care about Monsanto. It's not it's not partisan. There's all these partisan divides and ways of trying to split us up over cultural issues. I think most people are on the page that like we've got to do something about the food system. Healthier food is what we need. Um, and they don't trust companies like Monsanto, which is why it had to change its name. <laughs> it's still out there. Um, so I just think we yeah, how, how can we find paths for for common cause? Because I think we have a lot more in common. Um, then we have that divides us. Well, thank you for that. I think that is a great place to end the uh, the Q and A. I I thank you for the your time. If if we can unmute the audience, <laughs> that would be great. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.